thank you so much, Mayuri. That was so lovely to listen to you, and it just brought back such lovely memories of Angi Kel. Um, but before I start, I just want to say a huge thank you to the Munch team. Um, Mira, thank you so much for asking me to do this. It's such a lovely, lovely way to listen to people's stories. I also want to thank Ambika, Vidya, Suhani and Sukhashmi as well. Without you all, I don't know how we would do all of this, the tech stuff especially. Um, so my name is Subha Subramanian. I'm a choreographer, uh, a dancer and artistic director of the Academy. Just to put this in context, firstly I know it's super windy, we'll not stay out for very long, but I just thought it's such a beautiful day, it felt such a shame not to be in my garden for a little while. Just to give you a context of where I am, this is a little village called Whiteleaf, um, it's near Princess Risborough, and the house I live in is about 400 years old, and I'm in my garden, and I'm hoping that the wind doesn't pick up too much and affect the sound. And also, because I live in a tiny little village, the internet might be just very slightly dodgy. So if it is, I'm so sorry, but I will do my very best. I'm hoping that my stories and some of my journeys might resonate with some of you who are listening. Um, my journey is not necessarily a conventional one, but um, I do what I do, mainly because of the people that I have had the opportunity to work with and the people that I continue to work with. And so much of what I make is informed by um, the people, my life and everything that I've seen. And so what I want to do is just share some of that with you today. I was born and brought up in Malaysia. Um, my childhood was, was pretty normal. I don't come from a family of hugely artistic parents or um, my parent, none of both my parents didn't dance or play any music, but my childhood was filled with music. Thank you so much, Mum and Dad, because what you did is there was music everywhere. There was either Tamil songs, there were devotional songs, there were film songs, there was ABBA, there was Michael Jackson, there was pop music. There was just music all around me, and I kind of grew up with that, that sort of sense of rhythm kind of naturally with us. Um, we were a particularly sociable family as well. There were always loads of people coming over to the house, and we used to have these family gatherings. And at some of these family gatherings, there was always a disco to finish things off and the kids would be dancing the mums and dads as you know what it's like but honestly there was a disco I was there I was giving it some on that dance floor whenever I could I was always always dancing so I think my sort of when I thought about it actually my love of dancing came pretty much from disco and those sort of dodgy discos I did when I um, when I was a, a kid and I think from about the age of five or six, I kept pestering my parents to send me to a Bharatanatyam class because I, I kept watching the most beautiful, beautiful Tamil films with dance and I, I saw lots of Bharatanatyam. I remember going to watch Chandra Banu, who um, sort of started this organisation called Temple of Fine Arts, or part, he, wasn't, he didn't start it, but he was part of it. But I remember watching him dance and thinking, that's what I want to do. I want to dance like him. So he was hugely inspirational. So my parents took me to this dance class um, that was part of the Temple of Fine Arts in India, in um, Kuala Lumpur, in Kuala Lumpur. And I met my first two teachers, Shivadas Ankhil and Vatsalanti, and I had this really quite um, wonderful, old-fashioned um, training right from the start. And I started when I was seven. And the lovely thing was that um, as soon as I started dancing, there were so many opportunities to go out there and perform, and it was really wonderful to be able to go out and perform. I did, Chitraka, you talked about the snake dance. I did the snake dance, I did the peacock dance. I mean, it was just so wonderful. And quite early on, I realized this was, this is what I really loved doing. I just genuinely loved dancing. I loved the routine, I loved the rigor, the rigor of training really, really early on, totally, that's what got me about the whole process. And um, even though I wasn't part of the main Temple of Fine Arts um, organization, I still felt the real sense. The Temple of Fine Arts in Malaysia, and I know they have a, a branch in Australia, they are this wonderful spiritual family of an organization who really made um, all their students felt a part of the family. Um, but when I was about 11 years old, we moved to the UK. 
My dad came here to study, so we moved over. We came to a tiny little town called Buckingham, not far from where I am right now, actually. And in Buckingham, um, I didn't do any dance classes, so I was here for two years. Um, I worked, I went to a primary school um, in Buckingham and didn't really engage with my dance. And I know at that time, I really, really missed it. But at the time when you come into a country for the first time and you're adjusting and adapting, it was really quite hard and dance was the last thing we thought about as a family. And then two years later we went back to Malaysia um, because my dad thought that it was a, the right thing to do. So we did, we went back to Malaysia and, and when I went back it was hard. I went back to my old friends and I had to adjust. Again, I couldn't do class because we just couldn't get, you know, my parents couldn't get me to class and I didn't engage with the form so it was a really long break. Two years later, I came back again to the UK, aged about 13 and a half, 14. And again, you can imagine what it's like in a quite a difficult, comprehensive school in Croydon. And I was having to sort of adapt. I was um, having to fit into friendship groups. It was really tough. But you know what? My brother and I, I think, became really quite, um, quite strong, quite uh, resilient creatures, I think, as a result. And so at the time that I wasn't dancing, I, used, I just remember playing a ton of sport. I played a load of badminton, I played hockey, I played football, I played a load of sport. And I think my, the, miss, the, the dancing that I missed kind of went into sport. And in 1988, I discovered the Pavan. I will always remember the day I walked into the Pavan, into the Happy Hall, and saw a room full of wonderful dancers. And I just thought, you know what? I think I've found the place I want to, to, to be and I then met Sri Prakash Adigade, my wonderful, wonderful guru. To me, he is one of a kind. Um, he taught me with such generosity, kindness and best of all with a wonderful sense of humour. And he taught, I feel like he taught me in such a way that just instilled the sense of freedom to go and do with that form whatever I wanted. You know, he gave me the confidence to go and understand the form and do whatever I wanted. Um, and although my work consequently with Angika and with um, Sadhana hasn't been in that traditional context, I've never felt judged, I have never felt anything but respect from Guruji for all that I do and I, I Huge, I am hugely grateful to him, so thank you so much, Guruji. I need to come to see you again and do class. I'm desperate to do class again. And you know, the Bhavan was brilliant, and Guruji was fantastic. I mean, he he just gave me so many performance opportunities. I performed everywhere. We did. I was even on Blue Peter, if any of you remember Blue Peter Live. Um, in you know, any performance, and it was brilliant because it was literally, you've got two days, learn this dance, and you're going out and performing it. You know, you've got live music sometimes, recorded music sometimes, you're on a pavement somewhere one day, you're on a stage the other, you're dancing for some dignitary somewhere another day. So it was just, like those performance opportunities are so, they were so invaluable. And they just give you this confidence to be able to do your form in a way that you feel comfortable with. And in all the summer schools, I know Mayuri just talked so lovingly about all the teachers that came. Same as exactly what Mayuri said, you know, Chitra Vishveshwaran, Padma Subramaniam, Sudharani Raghupadi. I mean, these were just some of the names. And we were so lucky to have all of these incredible people um, come and work with us. So I kind of took the conventional route um, to sort of in education. So just before I carry on my conventional route, I'm going to start walking into the studio because I think it's getting quite noisy with the wind. So I'm just going to start going in. So just bear with us if it's slightly clinkety clunkety that when we walk back in. So this is, um, I have a tiny, I'm really blessed to have a tiny little studio space where um, I've made quite a lot of work. Uh, we watch a lot of films and it's generally kind of a little fun space. But um, come and join me in the studio where it's probably a bit less noisy. Um, so, and excuse my clipboard as well. And if you hear a little sound, that's from one of my little helpers. Um, I say one of my little helpers. I have a big helper and a small helper. But my son Hal is just going to pull the shutter down so that you can actually hear me. So um, if you don't hear me, if you hear a little noise, that's because of that. So just going back, um, I went on a conventional route in order to sort of, in terms of my education. So I did all my A-levels and then I went to King's College London and did a degree in biochemistry. And then it was just after that that I thought, 
you know what, the, the calling for me wasn't research. During my second year of my degree, I spent three months in Italy um, doing um, some research in a pathology lab. And I realised really quickly that although research is incredible, it was actually, for me, a really lonely process. And what I really wanted to engage with was dance. And this was my time. I'd done my degree and I could, the thing that was my hobby now became the thing that I wanted to do. And all the way through university, I had so many different things going on. I did my very first solo Bradmanty performance, my Aaron Gitron, during university time. I also did, I think, one of the single most fundamental things that made me think about dance as a career. I was part of Yuva, which was a South Indie, uh, South Asian youth dance company. And it was amazing. I'm still in touch with some of the dancers from there. You know, Uzma Hamid, who is now Wayne McGregor's dramaturg. Shivani Satya, who's a beautiful Kathak dancer who now lives in Rome. I know Jiva is in Australia. Sneha is still dancing. You know, so I know that Yuva did a lot for all of us. And it was brilliant because there were two choreographers. There was um, Valisa Bea, um, who's now in Sri Lanka, and Shodhana Gulati, who's you know, quite a well-known actress. And Nitin Sawney did the music for one of the pieces. And it was amazing because we were all in sort of De Montford University halls. We were all kind of making work together. We all stayed in the, in the student halls, Nitin included. Um, and we made this piece of work. And then we toured it. It was a prolific tour. And I, and I realised that, do you know what? This is, this is great. I can, I can kind of see myself doing this. This is, this is good fun. So Yuva was really quite fundamental point when I thought, yep, yeah, I think dance can happen. Um, then I did my very, very first proper job um, in dance, and that was to be dancer in education for Sherwood Jensing Dance Company. Now that was um, really quite uh, a real eye-opener, because what I learned to do was to do dance workshops, and I learned to use the form and take it everywhere. And then I started to realise education, as well as um, dance, was another really, really big part of my life. I thoroughly enjoyed going into I cannot tell you how many schools, universities, colleges I have been to in my life where I've taken dance in some form or another. Um, and I learned so much. The most wonderful, wonderful Chris Thompson, who was Head of Learning and Participation at the place at the time, was running a lot of um, Chauvinist education work. And he just literally sent me off to go and watch a whole bunch of people doing workshops, mainly contemporary artists. You know, I remember going to a talk, a lecture demonstration that Matthew Bourne was doing about the first works he was creating because he thought it would give me a real insight into process. I mean, he was incredible in just training me up to do workshops. And then I also got to learn tiny bits of Shogun's rep, which was fantastic, really fantastic. Um, and then another thing was my, at that point, was one of my first interactions with Academy. Uzma Hamid, who I just talked about, was a community officer at Academy, and she'd set up this series of workshops. And the workshops were literally, you could go into, I was going into all sorts of settings. I went into care homes. I worked with a bunch of visually impaired people at the Royal Opera House doing workshops. I worked with Jay Chandran, learning how you would possibly go into prisons or detention centres and do use dance to create some element of engagement. I mean, it was just amazing. And all of this just made me realise that education was another big part of my life. Um, and then I had another kind of first performance sort of um, work that I was part of was with Nina Rajarani. I worked with her quite a lot as well. And then got to work with the Kanan James, this amazing dancing duo from Chennai, who I have a huge amount of love and respect for. Um, and it was during this time at the Bhavan and all of this, and during sort of working with Nina that Mayuri and I met and realised that actually, we, what we wanted to do with the form, this is what I think made what we did really interesting, is we both wanted to do the same thing with our form, just slightly push those boundaries, slightly push the way we worked. And I think that's what made our work for, for a lot of people really quite interesting at the time. You know, we were working so solidly with the form. We were working with Bharatanatyam trained dancers from all over the world, really. And, um, you know, when we went to create Sudarshana, John Ashford of the place, um, he was instrumental, he had faith. And this is my sort of start, I'm talking about people who've had um, faith in me um, and what I was trying to do. And faith in me as an artist, it's not even about the work, but what I wanted to make or what I 
what I really wanted to make work about. And that faith, having faith in that artist and giving them the support was, I mean, John Ashford was incredible. He was absolutely brilliant. So, you know, he made us associate artists at the place. You know, we were two young South Asian choreographers. A few years later, we were choreographers in residence at the place. I mean, that kind of support is totally and utterly invaluable. And through Angika, through all the works we did, I learned so much about collaboration. I learned so much about making ensemble work. We had duets. I mean, Mayuri and I used to joke about the number of performances we did as duets. We, I think one piece we performed 40 times up and down the country. How much the touring landscape has changed now, another issue. Um, and it was during all this time that I did a PDCE, which is a postgraduate certificate in education at the Institute of Education, and I did it in science. I just thought, you know what, I really enjoy this teaching and I want to do something with it. And then I also then started teaching in a secondary school. So I was kind of doing this really bonkers juggling act of kind of making Angika work in the evening post-teaching, teaching in a, uh, a school full time. And then it was all a bit crazy. And then I was also, stupidly, doing a master's in education at the same time. So by the end of all of this, I had a BGC, I had a master's I was teaching and Angika was going on. So it was certifiably a bonkers time in my life. But then when Angika started to take off, I left the teaching and um, Angika went sort of full-fledged um, work and then we started to create ensemble work, Bhakti being the first one. You know, we worked with dancers from the UK, from India, from the US, from Malaysia. Anusha Kedar, who um, Mayuri was talking about, was one of our dancers. Gayatri Vadivelu, a beautiful dancer who's currently in France. Nurjahan Behum. I mean, we had so many wonderful dancers. Um, I think Kamala Devan danced with us as well. We were prolific in touring. I mean, our work, you know, went everywhere. And after 10 years, we became a regularly funded organisation. Um, and I remember John Ashford introduced me to this incredible um, theatre maker called David Lynch, I think he's called. I can't remember now. But, um, and he said, Super, somebody wants you to be part of a 24-hour performance. How do you feel about that? I said, John, that's a bit crazy, right? Who does 24-hour performances? Anyway, next thing you knew, I was in Copenhagen. I was with 11 other artists. And uh, we were doing a show from 8 p.m. on a Friday to 8 p.m. on a Saturday. It was crazy. I learned, I mean, I was the only dancer, uh, only South Asian dancer. And I learned really weird and wonderful things. Like I learned how to do the Sufi spin. I learned how to... Um, uh, how to be an actress. I remember spending three hours in the vicinity of the Kampnagel Theatre in Copenhagen, around the streets, pretending I was Marlena Dietrich. Now, that was a kind of training we were doing for this 24-hour show. We were on stage for 24 hours. And John Ashford, I think, came to Copenhagen and watched at least six hours of that. Now, that was proper dedication. So, you know, these people had faith and it meant a lot to me. So after 12 years of Angika, when we decided to do different things, I uh, set up Sadhana. And at that point was when suddenly the science started brilling up to the top. And I actually found that I wanted to make work about science. And I was really inspired um, to make work. And you know, what really inspired me is the thing I always say is I wanted to instill a curiosity in people. I didn't want to teach about science. I didn't want to tell people anything. I wasn't an education piece. It was just to instill a curiosity. I wanted to make abstract dance, but the nothing was still the starting point. So for me, that was my start. And I, I think I genuinely believe that Parthenatium is a language with which you can engage people, the public, about scientific concepts. I think the languages that we have as South Asian dance languages are incredibly rich and rich enough that we can tell everyday stories. So the very first piece that I made was called The Shiver. Now, at this point, I'm going to try and put on the... Actually, I might come back to that in a minute. Um, so the first piece I made was The Shiver. But I also wanted to share with you at this point some of the things that I think really inspired me. So The Shiver was, came about because I met this really incredible scientist called Professor Morten Kringleback. And he's a neuroscientist. No, you heard right. Professor Morton Kringleback is a neuroscientist. And we met at this event called the Creative Brain. We were talking about creativity and my form and him and 
art and um, quite quickly I realised that he was really interesting and then I realised he had a degree from the Institute of Art in Denmark too so he was also an artist and we both talked about um, actually creating work and this very fine line between pain and pleasure and that was his speciality he was looking at pain and ple pleasure in the brain and then quite soon after I met this um, well I didn't I knew of this wonderful poet and if you don't know his work I, I suggest you go find his books, his poetry, an incredible poet called Lem Sisse. Lem um, and I shared another sort of experience of this project called Cake Farewell, which I'll explain in a minute. So I commissioned Lem to write a whole spoken word piece for this, this work, Shiver. And he wrote the most beautiful piece. And I even managed to choreograph him into one of our pieces at the Bloomsbury Theatre. He actually performed on stage with us. Um, and when we were making this piece, Morton would come into the studio and spend a huge amount of time with the dancers. And he'd watch the work and he'd say, now that section there, what are you trying to say? And I said, oh, I'm trying to show that there is actually quite a fine line between pain and pleasure physically. And he went, no, I can't see that fine line. I, I don't get that. So it was a real collaboration between us. He'd bring in videos and explain sort of basic neuroscience to us. And it was also at this time that I met the most incredible collaborators um, anybody I think could work with, but I am slightly biased. I met, um, I knew and I met years ago, Kathy Hyde, who is an incredible audiovisual artist. I always say that she helps you visualise sound and music. And her partner, Matt Olden, who is a super whiz with tech. So, you know, Kathy kind of designs and he makes the tech work. And I also started working with Aideen Malone, a lighting designer that Mayuri and I worked with, um, with Andy Kerr. And the most incredible um, Chris Fogg. Chris Fogg is a published poet and has been a dramaturg on all of my work. But actually, just going back a step, I just want to acknowledge one very, very important person in my life, and that's Jamie Watton, who's not with us anymore. And Jamie um, gave me this position as associate artist at South East Dance. It was a funded place for two years, and he even asked me to sit with him and select the other associate artists. And Jamie Watton, um, at that point in my life, was just fundamental, important, and came along at the right time. It was like everything in the universe was lined up. And from then on, he stayed till he died, um, somebody really dear to me. And I know that when I you know, got anything, I'd always call him and say to Jamie, Jamie, I've got this, or I'd always say to him, I don't know what to do about this. And he'd be there, and we'd go and have a drink together in London, and we'd talk about anything and everything. And I... And I can honestly say I genuinely miss him because there's so many things I want to share with him now and, um, and he's not with us anymore. Um, so, yeah, so after the shiver, I got another moment of Academy help. I got one of the Academy's big commission bursaries, or commissions, actually. And that helped me make my second piece. Um, and that was uh, Elixir. But before all of this, this is where I start with my introduction. I became involved in a project called Cape Farewell. Now, in 2003, the really lovely Emma Gladstone um, from Dance Umbrella, um, who's now at Dance Umbrella, said to me, do you do sounds, right? And I said, yes. And you do dance? I said, yes. She went, right, I need you to go and meet David Buckland, who runs this project called Cape Farewell, and he really needs someone like you to go along. So I did. We chatted, and before I knew, he said, would you like to come to the Arctic with me? It's in a wooden sailboat. You'll have to do a bit of sailing. There'll be 19 other people on the boat. There'll be artists, scientists, a film crew, and I'd really like you to come and kind of be both sort of the science, arts, teachery type person. And I said, you are kidding me. I was born in Malaysia and under 33 degrees Celsius. I'm not in a million years did I think I was ever going to go to the Arctic. And before I knew it, I was going to the Arctic in that boat, the Nordic. I cannot begin to tell you how much love I have for that boat. Um, and that's quite typical of what we were experiencing. Um, so there were 20 of us on that boat. I was with scientists, I was with artists. And my role in that very first voyage was to do all, a lot of the kind of interviews of all the scientists and all the people we met to create resources for science and geography. But my dancing didn't stop. So during that voyage, I made a film inspired entirely by the sounds of bearded seals in the water. This wonderful man and um, beautiful musician and sound artist, Max 
Eastley was sticking those hydrophones inside the water. And he was recording, like, he'd stick, not that particular one, but he stuck, like, um, he stuck these sort of hydrophones inside the water and I heard the sound of these bearded seals. And before I knew it, um, I was making a dance on the boat and the most incredible dance filmmaker, David Hinton, oh, what a chap, an amazing man, the eye he has, he kind of helped to make that film. So you can see how cold it was. That was, I think, at least minus 27 degrees. Um, and part of the Cape Farewell project, I got to go to the Arctic four times. Um, the projects included, I did two education projects, and everywhere I went, I took them home the night with me. That's a, the very first young people's voyage in 2007. I had them all in Svalbard in Norway, in the Arctic, doing the Namaskaram and a dance that we filmed. So I've taken Bhaganatya to the Arctic, which I'm really quite proud of. Um, and also, you know, we spent a lot of time with the Inuit community. You know, these are kind of one, two wonderful Inuit kids, so I just love their smiles. And, and it was trying to understand so much about what climate change is. And the whole project of Cape Farewell is about raising awareness about climate change and bringing all aspects of life together to do that. And listening to these people's way of life, the only way are hunter-gatherers, you know, you take away the sea ice and when it melts and it doesn't, it just creates a huge change in lifestyle. Um, and this is a photo of the very first piece I was talking about, the shiver. So you've got um, Kamala, Anusha and Eleanor in the piece. And this piece was really, for me, a, a real exploration into the science, as I was saying. And this is my second piece, which was held by the Academy Bursary. And also I was um, artist in residence at the Environment Institute at UCL for a whole year. And during that year, the thing that came, kept coming up as a problem was water and our relationship with water. And I knew that I could make a piece of dance about our cultural relationship with water, but I couldn't make a piece about the beauty of every single drop of water. So then I commissioned an artist to create these beautiful little sculptures um, out of to look at the beauty of every single drop of water. And these sculptures were incredible. And, you know, that little drop of water eventually comes onto a screen and acts as a little um, magnifying glass. And that's a piece by Heraclitus, which talks about the fact that you never stand in the same river twice, which I think is hugely beautiful. Um, and I did a lot of research. We did that piece outdoors. We did five versions of that piece for outdoors. You can also so the Elixir, we have Vila Basvarajaya, Divya Kasturi, and Archana Balal there. And we did this piece outdoors. It was amazing. One of the things about my work is I never ever go to a place, perform, and come back. But for me, I don't then engage with the audience enough. So I always have a post-performance discussion that engages with the audience or the public in any way possible. Now this is a piece that I made inspired by this. So the man, the bald man in the middle, is called Professor Roger Kneebone. I'm not making this up, he is called Professor Kneebone and he is a surgeon. And I remember watching him do a surgery simulation and discover that actually it's quite choreographic. And he has this inflatable operating theatre that goes up and comes down in three minutes, literally. And Roger and I had a chat, and this was when I was pregnant, heavily pregnant with my little boy Hal. Um, well, nearly 10 years ago, and, um, and so I made this piece. So this is actually two of my dancers having a go at doing keyhole surgery. So this was the whole research for Under My Skin. So when I talk about stuff actually inspiring me, we got the dancers in, he'd bring all the instruments in, we made the stuff with the dancers actually having a go. I think it was a pig's heart, I think, I can't remember. Um, so this is, quickly I'll zoom through some of the image of Under My Skin. That's Carl and Archana. And um, we were trying to look at ways that we could use gestures that really mimicked um, the work. Now, that is two shipping containers, yes, you're right. And that's my work um, called Under Unkindest Cut. And I made that work uh, because I was really interested in young people mental and mental health. Um, and that it was a massive, it still is, and it always, it will be a huge problem. And I worked with Dr. Partha Banerjee at the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services with our system residents there. And I created this work after spending a huge amount of time and research with patients in sessions, one-to-one -one sessions, family sessions. And I created a piece of work in two shipping containers. And inside it, I created an installation. And this is again, Kathy, Matt, Aideen, um, Chris and I had an incredible team 
We've toured it to six different science festivals up and down the country. There were two metre huge tubes of light inside the container. There was spoken word, voices of young people telling you stories about their experiences of mental health. And it was wonderful to take Paraphernatium to science festivals and talk about science as well. My son's telling me my time's nearly running out, I'm aware. Um, and then I just wanted to, ooh, oh, I might have to go and ask my little boy to go and put them in the slideshow. Thank you, Hal. Um, so very quickly, um, two years ago, I had this incredible opportunity to go and be, um, so I'm going to have a skip it all through, bear with me. You get another chance to see one of these. Two years ago, um, I went to this incredible place, Sri Lanka. Thanks to an amazing man called Neil Butler, who runs UZ Arts in Scotland. I went to Sri Lanka. I was put together with seven other artists for six weeks. It was painful to go because I had to leave my son, I had to leave my husband, but I went and I was told to go and be an artist for six weeks. What I did, what that showed me was I was surrounded by artists working in all works of art and suddenly I was seeing the world through different lenses of different people and I really have never ever been in a situation where I was told to just go and immerse myself in a place and go and make art and that's what I did. And I made this piece of work um, with a visual artist called Brian Hartley and I made this work where Brian literally paints on that sari the word surrender in Tamil because to me, surrender said so much about life in Sri Lanka for the Tamils in Sri Lanka, and I wanted to create a piece. So I start the whole piece. So this is where we rehearse. That's Tanaja and Tim from Sleep Dogs in Bristol. Thank you for doing that for me. They made the music for me. We created sounds. We rehearsed on that lovely, wonderful place. And I created this piece where, after Brian's drawn on that sari, we fight, we literally fight. And eventually I'd get the sari off him, I'd get the audience to help me put it on, and then we walked onto the beach and laid it out, and then we walked off. I made a dance film, that's me on the beach. I know, it's tough, right? That was a tough life, working right by the beach, seeing the sunset every, every night. It was just incredible. I mean, it was life-changing as an artist. I, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. It's a half an hour story, that. And, um, and I made a dance film, and I'm just leaving you with this image just to leave you finally to say that actually so much of um, what I've done is inspired by so many of these pictures and so many of these experiences. And, you know, this South Asian dance is such a rich vocabulary, and, and I'm now really fortunate to be the Artistic Director of Academy. I've taken over from an incredible woman Mira, for 30 years, did all the fighting for us. She fought so hard to put South Asian dance on the map in this country. You know, I, I'm, we're doing this wonderful heritage project that Shivangi Agarwal, who's a beautiful dancer and a manager of our heritage project, is doing at the moment. And she um, is discovering all this stuff. And you realise how difficult those fights were. So thank you, Mira, for doing all of that so that now I can take over and... Um, and I really want to normalise South Asian dance. I really want us to not think of it as an exotic dance form, not think of it as only seen in X or Y, but to see anywhere and everywhere. It should be in everybody's psyche. You know, I am so blessed um, at Academy. Kirsten Burroughs, the exec director and joint CEO with me, the two of us have the most incredible team at Academy. Team Academy, you rock. Honestly, you guys are so wonderful. You are dedicated. And, you know, most importantly, you care, like we all do. Um, and I'm really, really excited about the fact that our forms can tell everyday stories. We can make pieces about climate change and about our use of plastics. We can use Kathak Bharatanatyam and Odyssey, and that's what I'd love to see. And also, you know what, there are some artists making some amazing work. I'm just picking a randomly a few people, so I'm really sorry if I've missed you out. But, you know, Sita Patel is making incredible work. Shane Shambhu, Kamala Devam. You know, we've got the Rerouted Collective, looking at how we actually make work as a collective. You know, we are in a pandemic, and I hope everybody who's watching this as well. I mean, this pandemic will not stop us. We will find new and interesting ways to share our art form. And I am genuinely excited. Um, so before I finish, I want to read a little piece by somebody incredible, um, Aaron the Roy, who I think is an incredible writer, and I'm just going to take a tiny bit from that. But before I do that, I just want to say, please don't forget tomorrow, we have got the incredible Nahid Sadiqi 
and the marvellous Maven Koo tomorrow. So please don't miss them on our very last Munch UK double bill. And I want to leave you, before I leave you, with this reading by Arundhati the Roy. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight it. <laughs>